Thank you, Ms. Cowling. It's good to be in the presence of God. I mean, sometimes, you know, other times you're in the presence of God by faith because you got so much going on. And other times you just, you just slide right in like butter. It's just like you just, just slide right in like knife, just cutting butter. And, you know, it just either way, you just, you just take it as it comes. If it's by faith, sometimes it's, faith is harder than other times. You know what I mean. It's if, depending on what you're going through, what your mind's saying, what your experience is, it's maybe harder to be in faith. Other times it's not. And you just take it as it comes, and you, you magnify it, you use it. And, you know, we just have to be encouraged that life sometimes is kind of like how, you know, I think Pastor says this sometimes, but it's like the, the stock market. It, you know, it's kind of up and down, but if you look over time, it seems to be going up. And, that's, uh, you know, I understand that some of you in here, it's always up. It never <laughs> flickers. But for the rest of us worldly, low-level people, it goes up and down, but as long as it's going up, you know, we praise God. And again, it's just, you know, I, I, what I, I'm always reminded, you know, it, it, there's times in life that it seems like, boy, this is just a hard time. Like, it, it doesn't have to be a, a stretch of time. It could be a moment, a decision, a, a something to confront, something with a kid, something with a coworker, something with, if you're a business owner, something with another business owner, something that maybe you dropped the ball, maybe somebody else dropped the ball, who knows? And it seems in that moment is just so intense that the only thing you can think of is like, Lord, it will be good if you came right about now so I don't have to deal with that. Anybody else been there? I was there as a kid. I knew how to do that as a kid. I'm like, boy, this spanking is going to hurt. Lord, it will be nice if you come right about now. I, you know I've already repented to you, and it's all done, but Mama is not happy, and it will be, you know what I mean. Now magnify that as an adult, right? And I just say that sometimes it's just difficult, but as long, just be encouraged. If you would think about the last moment like that, a year or two, three years ago, and remind, yeah, that, was, that seemed like an impossible situation, but I came out of it. And, and be encouraged and just think, yeah, this too shall pass. We will be talking about this later on. And, and you know, some things you talk about, you cringe, you're like, I don't even want to think about it. I've literally thought about something that I did and said, and literally, I just want to crawl under the rug. Because I'm thinking, how could I have just been so dumb? How could I have just said that? But you know what? It passed. I'm glad I'm not back there. So I'm just saying that to just encourage us. If that's you today, this too shall pass. Just worship God. And, and, and you know, if it's your mess, just see somebody who can help you. Find the scripture. Repent and just do the best you can. There's nothing. You can't cry over spilled milk. You can't put it back in the jar. So just... Move on, and, and, and if it's not you, and this is one of the high points, just like, praise God, I'm enjoying it today, yeah. but if it's you tomorrow, you know, it's just life. Yeah. It's just life, when we just have to be honest and just say, up or down, left or right, we just serve God. Yes. We serve God, and this too shall pass. We'll move on, and it's just going to be like any other time. We'll look back and say, boy, you remember that when I was in that bad spot? Yep, and I came out of it, and just just push through, just just, you know, just look for it. Get help if you need it. But the point is, don't quit God. Don't mope around. Woe is me. No, just, just look to all the victories you've had. And just use that as an encouragement to move forward. All we can do is move forward. All we can do is move forward. It doesn't matter how bad it is. It's already done. And there might be some fixing to do, and maybe there's some lawyers involved, then some court. I hope it's not that extreme. But if it is, we're just going to face it. It's not, yes, and if Jesus could come back right now, that would be great. But he's probably not coming right now. So if he's not, then you just have to face it until he comes. Amen? So that's just an encouragement. That's just an encouragement to you. This is not my message, but I wanted to encourage you in this as we were praying it. This is Luke chapter 11. You know, if you, if you take no, notes in an orderly way, you can just put that down before you actually take, take a note. So this probably has nothing to do, and maybe we may move on, but, it, you know, if you've been around here long enough, you know that sometimes the Lord does what he wants to do. So I'm hoping to just read this scripture and just say one or two things and move on. But if not, praise God. This is Luke chapter 11, and it starts out by saying, verse 1, Now it came to pass, I still hear pages turning, so I'll wait. 
Now it came to pass, as he, Jesus, was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Now, side note, that would imply that Jesus hadn't taught them to pray, that John has taught his disciples, right? And I'm just saying that to say sometimes, again, when it's our job to do something, we get so uptight thinking, we just got to get it all right. Well, oops, did Jesus forget to teach him how to pray? I thought prayer was one of the most important principles of Christianity. But here we can see that he didn't teach him how to pray, and we still say he's perfect, right? Yeah. Amen? I just say that to say, did he miss it? He should have taught them to pray earlier. Maybe they would have prayed. Who knows? But the point is, he just taught them to pray from right then. He didn't dwell on it. And sometimes... Some of us, not all of us, because other, other of us are on the other extreme, where nothing bothers us. It's all roses all the time. We could be a little bit tighter, right? But some, other, a little, some of us are winding a little too tight, just a little bit too tight. I mean, it's like too tight. I can't, I can't say that enough. But notice, prayer is the, one of the most important principles. And here, a disciple is reminding the master who knows and answers prayer? Can you teach us how to pray? Think, let that sink in for a second. As a teacher, I understand, how, you know, a curriculum and how the most important things are, right? And, and if we're in a class, let's say elementary class and, uh, you know, elementary school, whenever they teach addition, subtraction, division, and all that, and we're on, on division, and at the end of the lesson, the end of the year, the student raised their hand and say, Ah, uh, uh, Dr. Blockwood, could you teach us how to add? Mm, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. You know, we're way into it now. And I, I'm, I just forgot to teach you about that. Think about that. That is the, 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 what we're seeing here. I just want to say, just, just chill out. Yeah. Chill out. If it comes up, he just taught him to pray, pray right after that. This is not us, don't get me wrong, we're not going to the extreme. Yep. I heard the message, chill out. I've got things to do at work. Ah, you know, I need to do this. It's okay. I'm chill. No, that's not the heart of it. The point of it is, I don't even want to, I know your heart's going to cringe when I say that. We may miss it sometime. Not that God miss it. But the point is, it's not the end of the world. That's the point. It's not the end of the world. The most important principles of the Bible. And here you are, ways into his ministry, and they're having to remind him. Not only are they reminding him, they're talking about a lesser prophet has taught his disciples to pray already. And we know about it. Can you teach us how to pray? He didn't go, oh, oh what am I supposed to do? I missed it. You know, he just said, oh, yeah, sure. When you pray, say this. He didn't even acknowledge it. It's already happened. He's not taught them how to pray. It's already, it's, the time's already gone. Let's just teach you what you need to know right now and move on. And I bring that up again to, to just help us a little bit, okay? In life, it, we take life as it comes and we do the best as we, you know, we can. Again, hear my heart in this because I'm, I'm mindful that the other extreme of just saying, oh, yeah, I plan for nothing. I'm, I'm, yes, I'm the Jesus type of disciple. You know, I just, you have to ask me to teach you to pray before I do. No, that's not what I'm saying. You hear the heart of what I'm saying. Things happen, life happens. He was in, praying himself. They saw that and they, and they said that. That's not even the point I wanted to make, by the way. That's not why I turned to the scripture. It just so happened to be what was coming out. The reason I turned to the scripture is verse 2. So he said to them, when you pray, say, I've preached this several times and I'll keep preaching until we get it. You and I cannot pray in our head. The first lesson of prayer that Jesus taught his disciple is when you pray, open that hole right here and make a sound. Let it come out. This is important. We don't have time to talk about, talk about why it's important and how it falls into it. Now, I hear my heart. Again, sometimes you're just like, I'm in the presence of God and I'm receiving from God and I'm saying nothing. And I'm just receiving the worship. That's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about your intention 
Your heart and mind has decided, I am going to pray to God. The first lesson, according to Jesus Christ, who forgot to tell, teach his disciples how to pray, and he's been reminded by his disciples to teach them how to pray, when he started to teach them, the first lesson was to open your mouth and say something. It is also one of the distinguish, dis, distinctions between us and animals, by the way. They don't have creative powers. I don't know why I'm comparing us to animals today a lot. But they don't have creative power. There's, crea there's creative power in saying. If you go all the way to Genesis, in the beginning, right? It was all the way this, and God said. Now, if anybody can create anything without saying anything, it will be God. Right? He could just think it and it happens. But that's not the principle and that's not how he operates. Nothing is happening until you declare it. I'm saying this because this ties into my exhortation. When we're going through those ups and downs, one of the things we can do is to declare something. Say it in English, it doesn't matter. Sometimes, you, sometimes it's your, your voice is gone. You, you know, you're just like, I'm just so downcast. I'm just so depressed. I just don't even have words for this situation. It could just be, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -mm -mm. A grunt, whatever. Make something happen, and by the time you realize, it'll turn within you. I just want to just, just hit on that a little bit. We don't even need to look at the rest of the prayer. The first lesson is what, what's happening. That's the difference between a thought and speech. They are, they are very much linked together, right? And if, if, you know, if you're an American or you've lived here enough to know the Constitution, that's not a freedom of just thought, because no one can stop that. It's a freedom of speech. It's important. Why is that in, in the number one? Because it's important. It's a declaration to, if you know anything about, you know, spirituality, you know that there is the, the world we live in and there's, there's the spiritual world. And we are spiritual beings. Speech is one of the way we declare to the environment around us, to our physical body, to our mind, whatever it is that we want to declare. If you're, if you're dealing with thoughts that are attacking you, it's, it's, you know, your mind, you just can't stop, you can just stop in the name of Jesus. You're commanding your mind, you're commanding yourself to stop. You know, it, it's just the way it works. It, and we can, I mean, again, most of you have, have learned about this, but we can go line up, we can start literally, I have no notes on this, but I can literally start to Genesis, and I can keep turning the page, and I can prove this to you over and over and over again, all the way to Revelation. It's one of the core principles of prayer, which Jesus, who forgot to teach him how to pray, was reminded by his apostle, when he was reminded, that was the first lesson he taught them. When you pray, say, and I know in your mind you may be thinking, well, I mean, I don't know. I think that's just the English because, he, you know. No, he, he's telling them literally. When, when you, you've got to pray, you have to declare a thing. There's even a scripture that says, declare a thing and it shall be so. Prayer is communication. Because without it, how would we distinguish the negative thoughts and bad thoughts from the good ones? You and I know squirrely things can come in your mind all the time that you have no control over. Maybe not even squirrely things, maybe good things. Maybe it could be like, you know, uh, where's Melissa? She's not here. She usually makes fun of me because sometimes I'm in service, I'm like, man, I could use some chicken right about now. And I'm like, wait, wait, I'm supposed to be paying attention to what pastor is saying, you know? And I'm like, and she's like, what, what, you were thinking about chicken? Yes, I was thinking about chicken again. And not that I, not even that chicken is my favorite food or something. I know what you're thinking, he's black, so he likes chicken. <laughs> I know, I know, it, it crossed your mind. See, that's the difference between declaring a thing and thinking a thing. You were thinking it, right, right, I can see. You, you were thinking, yeah, I can see, he, he probably likes chicken. Cause I, no, not all black people like chicken. This one just happens to, to like chicken. It's not my favorite, but, it, you know, it is what it is. I know James likes chicken, too, yes. I know, I picked another black person. It's because I know him, not because he's black. I know him, and I happen to know he likes chicken. Okay, who, if you like chicken, raise your hand. Thank you. See all the white hands going up? Thank you. Even Hispanic hands going up. Yes, thank you. Thank you. The point is, there's a difference between thinking something and declaring something. 
and it's very important that we're exercising that. Again, please don't misunderstand. There's a balance to this. I know I gave instruction to let's pray in tongues, and, and a lot of you are praying in English and all that. And, and if, you, if at that point you're like, I just want to soak in God's presence, fine. But if your intention was to pray and declare and you didn't open your mouth, you should have. Because it, it does nothing, literally, I, I, it just nothing. God's hear our hearts, right? He does. Yes, and I'm just not, don't get me wrong, I'm just saying like, yeah, could God answer something in your heart? Yes, but that's not the norm. You know, that's not the normal thing. There's a couple of, there's about two areas where two people prayed where nothing came out of their mouth. Only two in the whole Bible. Countless examples of prayer. In fact, the only reason we have those scriptures and prayers written down is because they said something. Had they just thought the prayer, we wouldn't even know that they prayed. We have no idea. You know, when, look at the first part of the verse. Now it came to pass as he, Jesus, was praying in a certain place. How did they know he was praying? How did they know he wasn't just sitting there looking at the rocks or whatever they looked at back then? How did they know? Because they saw him praying. In fact, sometimes they can write what he prayed down, right? So anyway, that's just my exhortation to you. In those hard times, whether it's a you know, low time or whatnot, just think back and, 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 and be reminded that this too shall pass. And say something. Declare something. Worship God. Praise is also the same way, by the way. Right now, you can tell I'm preaching or teaching and not praising God by what I'm saying. You can't say, well, he, yeah, the preacher, he was praising God. No, I'm not. But what if I'm doing it in my mind and you don't know it? Does it count? No. Right? So anyway, it's just my exhortation. I do want to, and the pastor wanted me to talk a little bit about a concept that we mentioned while we were doing parenting. And so, um, but this will help everybody. If you don't have kids, you are a son or a daughter of somebody. And maybe you have kids in the future. And I hope most people, most of you do, or all of you do. Um, or you are a, a still a young kid at the home, or you are a parent, or you will be a parent, either way, a grandparent, whatever, it fits everybody. And also think about it, too. There's part of the Bible that we read. When I was single, I, re I read part of the Bible about marriage, and it still blessed me because it's the Word of God. So I just say that to, to, to not be disengaged if you don't feel like you have parents. If you remember, we went through a series where we had panel discussions, right? Um, and also pastor preached, we, I, maybe it was about four weeks. It just felt like quite a, you know, there was a preaching, then two or three panel discussion, two panel discussion, then there was just another panel discussion with just Luke and Melissa, then pastor preached again. So we went through about a month of parenting. And one of those panel discussions we were talking, and um, I think we were talking about pride. And Melissa was saying something about pride. And, and then when it got to my turn, I said, well, pastor, a lot of times, you know, we forget that there's active parenting and, and, and passive parenting. And then later on, Pastor and other people have said that, well, we hadn't really thought about it in those terms before. We may know the concept. So Pastor has asked me to teach or to um, expound on that a little bit. There's not really much there to teach. It is what, it's just, just a statement. Um, I can expound and give more, uh, uh, more examples and talk more about the scripture. But what I mean by that is when, when, when you teach something, you can start from a little bit here, right? And you just build on and build on and build on and you just get the full revelation of it. What I'm saying is with this, it, it is what it is. It's, you know, it's a, plain, it's a statement. We can expound on it, show some examples, but it's not chronologically laid out in line upon line, right? And what I meant by that is we were talking about apologizing to your kids when, when you do something wrong. And, 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 I, and I, we were saying that, you know, when you, when you don't apologize, you're showing pride. And what I'm, what, the point that I was making is we can teach our kids humility all day long. You can teach somebody humility all day long. But when you demonstrate pride, that's you actively discipling them in pride. Even though, or, or you passively discipling them in pride, even though actively you're saying, okay, let's open our Bible to the, the verse that tells us to be humble and not to be bossy. And you're, you're saying those things, but by your actions, you're demonstrating something different. We, we call this, you know, we've seen this many times. Monkey see, monkey do. We've heard of this before. You, we've heard of um, 
Do as I say, not, not as I do, right? It doesn't work like that. Both, both, it takes both to parent. What you say and what you do are more powerful. And if those things are conflicting, God help us. If those things are conflicting, not only do we confuse our kids, we invalidate the word of God. Very, very important point. Now, this applies to discipleship as well. You, or, or us that are at the work, uh, at the workplace. We can say we're Christian or have the Christian bumper sticker, but if our actions demonstrate something else, that undermines our testimony. Similar concept. The only difference is we may not be discipling this person, but what we're showing is, is different. Um, so, so in discipleship, it's, it becomes, well, when you're wrong, you're wrong. And if you don't practice it, what you're really discipling your kid in is how to be prideful. Now, even, even the world in research tells us this, right? In, in child education, and you guys don't, I'm, a, I'm an educator, I have a PhD in education, master's in education, an undergrad in education. I've taught many, you know, for over a decade at the, at the K-12 level and the university level. And so education, even in the natural sense, tells us this, that you have to not only teach kids, you have to mo model the behavior in front of the kids. Very important concept, right? And, and so I, I'll tell you a story about uh, my son, um, Cephas. And uh, I, this is one of those things that I, I hate myself. But this was, I want to say, two weeks ago or something. It was a Sunday morning. We're coming to church. And he, he did something. And I'd ask him several times. And he was not telling the truth. And he just kept at me. And I said, OK, son, you know this rule. If you tell the truth, there will be some trouble, but it's not going to be near as bad as you if you lie. He's like, no. He stuck to his stress. Like, OK, you're getting a spank. He's like, no. He's like, he, and he, he's got this thing. He's like, let's go to the party. He's like, no, no. Can we talk about this? Can we talk about this? I'm like, what are, what are we? I mean, we're talking about it right now. It's like, no, just put, just put the party down. Can we talk about this, Daddy? Can we talk about this? And then, it, it, then it's like, how about mercy? Can I have some mercy? I'm like, no, you were lying. And I, and I said, I'll give you one more chance. And he stuck to his story. So I, I just spanked him. And then Mommy came out. I told Mommy the issue. And Mommy said, well, this, 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 this. Well, come to find out he was telling the truth. And I spanked him. And he stuck to his story. He didn't change it. So now I'm thinking, well, I'm very proud of you for not changing and lying as the truth so that I wouldn't spank you, right? Because he stuck to it to the end. But now I'm feeling like, yeah, what a doofus. I mean, I was, just, I, was just, I was just up on panels and discussion talking about parenting, and here I am <laughs> tearing up my kid because he is, you know. And, you know. and I remember myself, it just took me back. I, I'm, I was a little older than him because I was probably eight, nine. I was talking to uh, Brother Michael about this. And I remember multiple times, and I'm telling a, telling a story to a parent or aunt or uncle or whoever, and I'm lying, and I'm sticking to my story. Once I commit to the story, I was committed. I mean, you can wear me out, and I'm, I'm committed. I am committed. So in my mind, I flash by, I'm like, oh, no. All those bad seeds I sowed when I'm eight, my kid's ripping it, and he's lying to me, and he's sticking to his story. But that wasn't the case. He was actually telling the truth. So I'm like, oh. so I called him over, and I just felt so bad. I just felt so bad. So I called him over, and I said, I, I think I got the facts wrong. And I was so sure, because I looked at the facts and the evidence, and it looked like he was lying. I mean, all the evidence was showing that he was lying. Not just I didn't believe him, you know, but there was actual factual stuff that I could look at. Well, then mom told me that, no, it's, it didn't happen like you think. So I was like, oh. And I said, were well, you telling the truth? He's like, yeah, I was telling the truth, but you won't believe me. I'm like, okay, here we, and then so I said, I gave him a hug, and I said, I am so sorry, so, so sorry, and the first thing I just remember was like, that's okay, we all make mistakes sometimes. <laughs> really? Really? So then I'm like, yeah, I know, we are so sorry. He's like, yeah, that's okay, daddy, and then just the second part, he said, that's okay, daddy, even superheroes make mistakes sometimes. I'm like, oh, my goodness. You're making me feel hard, more, more worse than this. So I said, I'll tell you what. Next time you earn a spanking, I said, actually, we'll do it the next two times to earn a spanking. I will show mercy on you to make it up for this spanking. Because this was a hard spanking, because I really thought 
you're lying to my face. I've given you multiple and multiple and multiple. And he's never done that before. You know, usually if I say you're lying, he's like, okay, yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm fudging a little bit. And he'll, he'll correct himself. But this, he stuck to it through the spanking. So I'm, and, and, but I was blessed by his response. Because he has known, I have taught him that, you know, we all make mistakes. And that's the danger of us being prideful and not repenting or, or, or making things right when we're wrong with our kids. Because then it's showing them that, no, we're like God. We don't make mistakes. And when we're, even when we're wrong, it will end up being right. You know, I, this, this is several stories that are not my stories that I'm thinking about that I, maybe it may not be appropriate to say. Because um, they, they didn't tell me they were saying it in confidence, but maybe they were. So I, I may not share those. But in that moment, I remember thinking, I'm so glad that he's catching that. Another one of the, one of the principles we're teaching him is, you know, he usually gets good report. You know, he's a kid, so he gets some bad reports, but either whether at daycare or even in the back. And, you know, and, and I think in the back they give him green cards and a lollipop, which is not good for us, by the way, but I know you want to give it to our kids. So give it, at night it's not, but give it to him anyway, because I make him eat it the next day, because it's, it's too late when I, we get it, because he holds it and he has to ask. So he gets the candy or whatever. But then, now that he's four, he's about to be five, we're starting to change that a little bit and try to teach him, okay, doing good is a reward in itself. So you're not going to be getting a, a reward every time you're good because the reward in being good is being good. Right? Amen? It's not do good for candy, do good for this, but I, he's four. I mean, come on, I can't just say, yeah, doing good is doing it yourself, no candy, no anything. So I'm just trying to pick the times when we, we do that. So one day, we were in the car, and I forget the, all the story, but basically, he had, he had, I was just saying, son, I'm so proud of you. Your teacher said this, this, this. He's like, yeah, yeah, great. He said, um, so can I get a candy, or can I get a reward for being good? And then, and then mom was like, well, I don't know. We, we'll, let me think about it. And then I said something. He said, he said, um, I said, well, let's kind of wait on that. He said, is it because doing, he said, doing good is a reward in itself? And I said, yes. You get a candy for that comment. <laughs> because that's the comment I want, you know. And the point is, he's catching it. He's catching it. And, and because we as an adult, right, we do what's right because it's what's right. Sometimes at a cost to us. So let me ask you this. If we don't teach him that, when are we going to teach him that? It's not always link, linked to candy or a toy or something. It's okay if it is, but the real principle is the reward in being a good husband, being a good father, is being a good father. The, the, the hell that you, uh, to you uh, avoid from not being a bad father. So the good, the, the prize in doing anything the word says is do, the word. That's it. That's, it's the right and the best way. If you put two things up, this is the better way that will benefit your life. That's why we choose it, not because of just the reward. I understand, yes, we serve God. We get to spend eternity with him in heaven, you know, roads of gold and all that. Yes, I get it. But I'm not, I'm not thinking of that in the moment when I'm doing something good, when I have to choose a hard decision to do something. I'm not thinking, yeah, I ought to do this because those, those, those road paved with gold will feel real good on my feet. No, no, we're not thinking that. We're just thinking of what's good. So, so I say that to say we do our best, and I don't even think we're just figuring it out. You know, I want to finish a thought because there's so many thoughts coming. But you just... You parent, you are an employee, you are a husband, or wife, whatever it is that you are, you are doing that out of your walk with God. And it kind of ties into the scripture that I'm, I'm talking about. It's not just Jesus trying to be a teacher. And, and I'm, the, I'm the head minister here. I got a disciple. This is a check. I taught him to pray. No, no. These things come flow out of your walk with God. So when the where the opportunity came that he was praying and they asked him to pray, he didn't think, oh, I missed it. Prayer is an important thing I didn't teach him. It's flowing naturally out of your walk with God. They asked him to pray, how to teach him how to pray, because they saw him praying. He's demonstrating, he's passively discipling them how important prayer is. And by them seeing that, they recognize, you know what? We don't know how to pray. 
I, and I'm just speculating here because the Bible doesn't give us enough information, but it could be they saw him praying in a way that they're like, oh, I, I don't know about this type of prayer. He's saying this to God, saying that to God. He's, he's, you know, it's like, I think we're missing out on something. John taught us, is, 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 again, we're speculating here because there's not enough you know, stuff to say, but I bet John taught his disciples how to pray. We ought to ask him to teach us because what he's doing, that prayer he's doing, that's not how the Pharisees taught us. That's not how the writers taught us. And that's the way when we're talking about passive and active parenting. You are parenting husband and wife and grandparent, father and employee. What are, you're doing that out of your walk with God. It flows out of it. And it's not this pre-planned thing necessarily. As things come and you're walking with God, with the Holy Spirit, with the scripture, it, 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 the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance or your own spirit will burp it up, or your mind, something will bring it to you, and at that point you have a choice to choose the word or whatever your flesh says. That's literally what it, everything boils down to. Almost everything, we, every decision we do. Now sometimes we think we do the right thing, and then somebody will remind us, just like in my case with my son, I thought I was doing the right thing by, by disciplining him, and I was wrong. Big deal. So I just, you know, now he has a, uh, he has a get out of jail free card or a a, a credit on spankings, you know, and, it's, and it's because it's a credit, it's times two, because I believe in increasing. If you've been in my class, we talk about compounding interest. That's a compound interest right there, right? He got one spanking, and it's going to be good for two to get out of jail two, you know. But the point is, we don't want to just focus on teaching this word. It is important, but our modeling attitude it makes it way more powerful. And if it conflicts it, it makes it confusing, and if we're not careful, they will go more with what we're modeling over what we're teaching. Very important concept. So it's good to, to really not only focus on the active discipleship, active teaching of our kids. Yes, we're teaching them the word. We're teaching them how to pray. We're, we're doing all this, but are we modeling it? Uh, pay, do they see us pray? Do we pray with them? Do we teach them things? Do we demonstrate things to them? Um, let's look at this concept. This may also help us here. Here, look at Proverbs 22, verse 6. I do not want to necessarily open the mic up to every single person, but I would say at least the elders and some of the senior saints in here, if you want to say something. The mic, I've already told them they have the mic ready. We might, we might allow one or two other people to say something, but... I just don't want it to go everywhere for now. Um, Proverbs 22, starting from verse 6. We're talking about parenting, passive parenting versus, or, or active parenting versus passive parenting. You can call it passive, active discipleship, modeling versus instruction, whatever, however you want to call it. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old... He will not depart from it. Now, the way we teach this verse is, based, is literally what it says. We train up the kid, we disciple them, we teach them in the way they should go, and then when they are older, they will de de uh, depart from it. Almost as a promise from God. You do this, you get this. But I'm gonna, uh, let me present a different way of looking at the scriptures. In fact, the people that study this, theologians that study this, some people say it in that way. And the ones that believe it as a promise of God, they even emphasize that this is not necessarily talking about um, the morals and the spiritual, like, you know, you know the Bible, you know this. It's mainly, it, it, they talk about how, because in the way he should go, they emphasize the fact that every child's different. Their nature and the, the, the direction that God's given them. You train them up, you find out, I have two boys, and they are very, very different, and you find out where their disposition is, and you guide them and train them in that direction. That's one way, right? That's one way of interpreting it. Here's the second way of interpreting it. Another way of interpreting it is that the word should, it's not in the, it's not in the uh, Hebrew. In fact, that word did not even have a way of saying it back, back then. So if you take that out, it becomes... Not a promise, but a warning. So hear, hear it this way. If you train up the child, if you allow the child to grow up in the way they want to go, in other words, the, the foolishness that's in their heart, you just allow, guide it, they will not depart from it when they grow up. 
Now, that's a very different interpretation from the other one. Uh, it doesn't even matter which one you believe. Both of them, we can use both of them to, to teach. But I, I want to focus on the second one I just said. Allowing a child to, in a sense, kind of do their own thing. It's pretty popular right now to let four or five years to determine whether they want to be a boy or a girl, right? So you allow that child to grow up in, in whatever way, and it's, it's telling you as a warning that when they grow old, they will not depart from it, right? But to fit what we're talking about, what I want to focus on is the word train up. The word train up is not just about instruction. Think of training, any type of training, physical training, training to be a footballer, a basketball, whatever it is. It, there's a sense of repetition. There's a sense of following on how to do it, right? So if you allow a child, in the, and we'll take the one in interpretation of the verse, if you allow the child to practice and do the way their own heart wants to lead them, they sure will end up. And when they grow, it will be difficult for them to depart from that, if not impossible for them to depart from that. Now think about that. Let that sink in. And so it is up to us to model not what's in a child's heart. We all have been kids before. We come up with the dumbest things, and we think it's real. I will make up a whole story of, of, of a world. I'm like, are you, is this a, a, a movie or something, or is this, no, no, it's real. I'm like, really? So there was really robots in the street walking around. And, and they will swear it's up. And, you know, my point is, that's even rudimentary, but think about this. If we allow kids to just grow without any training, when they grow old, they will not depart from it. And I think that's what's happening when we only focus on this active thing we call discipleship. And we're only trying to actively show kids what the word of God said. We're bringing them to the church, they're going back there, but we are not practicing these things in front of them, at home or, or, or wherever. Is this making sense? Am I making sense? You know, you think about it. What is the first commandment with the promise? Honor, right? Honor your mom and your, honor your father and your mother, right? That it may go well with thee and your days will be longer on the earth, right? It is the first commandment with the promise, the Bible says. So you and I, when we have kids, it almost seems like that's the, one of the first things you want to show your kid. Demonstrate and bring them up. It. Here's another way of saying it. Honor is the first seed that God gives us that leads to all the other seeds. Think about what, how a seed works. If I had a corn, you know, a seed of corn right here and I plant it, just one, what's going to happen? If I tend to it and it grows up, it's going to produce corn. And I can, I can eat all the corn but just one. And in just that one corn I'll have, I don't know how many, you know, little seeds are in the corn. I can have, let's just say, 50. That I can plant 50 more. Think about that. And it's the first commandment with the pro a promise. And it's up to us to demonstrate honor. And as we know, as pastors taught us, honor by definition is high esteem. You, how you regard something, right? So by not, by not just saying, you need, to honor, you need to honor me, boy, you teach them. You demonstrate what it means to honor. If you're married, the first thing you can do is honor your wife. Your wife can honor the husband. And you're demonstrating them because it is the first seed that God gives them. And through that, think about what it says. That it may what? Go well with thee and all your days will be long on this earth. That encompasses all the other seed. If it's going well with you, you're prospering in your relationship, you're prospering in, in uh, church, you're prospering financially, school, and all those things. And you have more time to do it because you're living longer. Honor becomes a, one of those important things that we have to demonstrate in front of our, 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 kid, our, our children. Because if not, we will invest in them the wrong example. Does that make sense? All right, I hope, I hope you're, you're receiving this. So here I have, um, let me read a definition here of train, just, just from a book. And I promise I didn't put this in here because it says animals and people. I know I've been making animals and people references a lot today. Teach a person or an animal a particular skill or 
a type of behavior through practice and instructions over a long period of time, or a period of time. So both the train up in this verse has two components to it. The instruction part and the practice or the demonstration part. And it's very important that we think of both of them when we're, when we're raising our kids. Now, how does this apply to us that we don't have kids? That same thing, believe it or not, applies to us as Christians. It's not enough that we know the word. I, I, I know this. I know, I know you know where I'm going with this. But doing the word. But I want, I want us to take it a step beyond that. To actively be looking for opportunity to do the word. Because it's by doing that we receive, right? And, it, and as you know, even in education, they'll say, you know, if you, if you are studious in, in school, you will know that, you know what? The only way I understand this is if I can do the math problem. And I can tell you what the math problem is and how to work it. But I don't really understand it until I can do it and teach it to somebody else, right? Same thing happens. So if something is preached, most of the time, I'll say 90-something percent of the time, an opportunity will come up in this week or something for us to practice the word. But if it doesn't, we ought to be looking for that opportunity to put it in practice so it would stick. It will stick to our soul because if we do the word, we take one step up in that area. We'll just, we'll just, whatever that area, it doesn't matter. We'll say it's honor since we're talking about honor. If we practice the word in honor, we literally went from, if you can see a spiritual chart, we literally went from this is our honor level, we just did it today, to taking one step up. It's just like a muscle. And then we just do it again. So it's not just the training up. Think about it. If it's, all, it's applying to kids, then it applies to adults too in whatever that you're going to do. And I like the way this puts it as a warning in the sense, and, now, and I was telling somebody, I think it was Brother Chad, and he was saying that it doesn't, yeah, by faith, you can look at this as the, one, the first interpretation and say, by faith, I'm going to train up my child, and when he goes, he shall not depart from Praise God for that. We know how to walk by faith. But this other way also should teach us and bring more light to that word and, and, and to show us. So here, let me look at, I'm not going over my notes here, so I just want to look at this and see if I missed something. Yeah, so the honor for kids shows us that it is the first thing they can, the first word of God they can obey and be reinforced by the obedience. It literally teaches them that God's real. Think about that. I'm honoring my mom and dad, and life is going well for me. Now, there's a practical side to this as well, right? I mean, if you don't honor your mom and dad, you're, you're gonna, your hind end is going to be on fire, right? Yeah. So there's a practical, it's going well with you if your hind end is not on fire, right? Yeah. So, so there, is a, there is a practical part to this as well. It's not all spiritual. I think that's a lot of times we get caught up in that. We think, ooh, it's all spiritual. No, there is, it's literally practical. Yeah, if you honor your mom and dad, they won't wear you out. Yeah. It's just as simple as that. But we take it a step further, yes, spiritually as well. There's a spiritual co component to it that honoring gives us that. Now, if you think back, we're not going to turn that. I think it's Exodus chapter 20, starting from the first verse. It's the Ten Commandments. It starts out by saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Then it drops down and say, do not have any other gods before me. Then it, not till you get to the fifth commandment that it talks about honor your mother and father, right? So it seems to be the fifth thing on the list. But think of the first commandment. Do not have any other God before me. What is honor? Highly esteeming and putting something. That is the first commandment in, to us. Honoring God by making sure he's in his proper place and not coming down. And kids don't understand that. But what they do understand was, was, was in the front of them is mom and dad. And they can understand, you know what? If I can teach my kid how to honor me and my, my wife, it will go well with them. And also, that seed will produce them honoring God and get born again when they grow up. It's, a, it's such a beautiful picture. Such a beautiful picture that you can see that. So this, this it, it's passive because we don't think of it. It's passive. I call it passive discipleship because we don't think of the fact that me telling my kid, explaining to him that, hey, look, you're growing up now, not in these words, in, in words that he can understand, you're growing up now, so we're going to just have to start doing good because it's just good and it's right, not to get candy. And the fact that me just talking to him about that and he caught it and, and understand it brings so much joy to my heart. 
And think about how God feels when we catch those things. Um, there's so many places we can go now. Let me think of one. Let's look at, um, let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. If, if any one of these, I personally am a teacher, so I like it when, you know, if any one of the elders or someone, uh, senior saints have something to add, or you're not a senior saint but you have a question, then we can, we can get the mic ready. 1 Timothy chapter 3, hopefully you're, I thought we didn't have announcements, so in my mind I was like, yeah, we're going to get out early. Probably not, because I'm just, I'm not, I'm not going to preach long, but we'll see. Uh, did I say chapter 3? I just do chapter 5. I'm in chapter 5, so we'll just do chapter 5. And, and I, we are covering Timothy in, on Wednesday night. So pastor has preached this already. Um, and I, as I'm standing here thinking about it, verse 1 says, Do not rebuke an older man, I'm talking about an older saint, but exhort him as a father, young men as brothers, old women as mothers, younger women as sisters, with all purity. And then verse 3 says, Honor widows who are widows indeed, or, or real widows. Now, Timothy, even in chapter 3, sets forth rules and how to treat people in the house of God, right? It's talking about, and this is mainly to, to Timothy, the pastor, but it applies to us on how to treat each other in the house of God. But I want you to see the comparison. I think I've preached this before as well. Notice how he teaches them. In just one or two verses, he teaches them how to act. And how does he relate it to? The family structure. Because the Jewish had a culture, the Jews had a culture of the, the way the family structure is dicta dictated by God in the word of God. So he is assuming by this point you already know what the word of God says on how to treat your father, how to treat your brother, how to treat your mother and your sister. And he's saying that you already know how to treat them. So now let me tell you how to treat people that are now your spiritual brothers and sisters in the Lord. And it's making that simple comparison with the assumption on how to act in, in the church. Now, let me ask you this. If we fail to get that as parents, you see where that's going. That means that you have people that are not from the world, right, that are from our homes, Christian homes, or we'll say Jewish homes if they were Jewish Christians, that don't know how to act. What kind of church member would they be? And how would they affect, not just us, but how would that affect their own walk with God? Think about that. So a lot, I, I, I'm thoroughly convinced by, that if we all follow this, there would never be any church splits. If every church had this going on, there'd just never be a church split. There'd only be a sending out to, you know, this church is too big, we're having another branch over here, or something like that. And almost to what we did with uh, Pastor Caleb. But at actual church split, if you were walking this out, then that, would, that wouldn't happen. And then it reaches verse 3. It just, it just almost casually say it. Honor widows as if they're true widows. Like you already shouldn't understand what that means. You should know all that and it tells in honoring widows because this is something that you were taught as a kid, as a Jewish boy, how to honor your mom and dad. And so you get here. If I just say honor, you, you, knew, you know all the scriptures that has to do with it and you know what that looks like. And he doesn't have to expound. He just moves on to the next thing and then teaches the word of God. So it all starts from the home and how we're passively discipling our kids at home. Now, I think you know this, but the oldest, the oldest culture is the Jewish culture. All other, if, even heathens will tell you this, in this that, that's, that study this, will tell you, I listened to a college professor once saying this, it, it's, and he, he, this is her exact words, it's so fascinating how somehow, he said, every other culture, if you trace them back, have changed in so many different ways. But the Jews can trace their culture back all the way to, to Abraham. And, and a lot of that is intact. That cultural practices, and I don't mean culture, I don't think of the natural stuff, but the way they think as a people have been passed on from generation to generation. And it all starts from the home. You and I 
have to stop thinking as American, as Ghanaian, and Nigerian, whatever it is that we are, and start thinking in terms of kingdom-minded. We're not just teaching our kids or discipling our kids to succeed in America, to succeed in Nigeria, to succeed in Ghana, wherever it is that we think we're going to live. It's that the, the, what we are giving them is leading them to be part of the kingdom of God. And as we all know, they say the church is shrinking. In fact, one, one um, Christian scholar that I read after, pastor, I think he was an Anglican pastor, a very, I mean, the, the things he say are very sharp. He had done some research and he talked about how he is very much concerned for his own kids and grandkids and how, they will, how much of the church they would participate in. Because at the rate, not just because of the way the church is shrinking, but he's talking about the American culture being more individualistic. If you've ever been anywhere else, uh, like Brother, Brother um, Pastor Brett could have conf confirmed this. If you've lived anywhere else, the individualism that's here, which has its good parts, but has tremendous negativity as well, if, if you understood it, you'll see how much of it is more, our flavor of Christianity is more American than you think. Uh, some of the ones, some of you that have, have visited other countries, you, you know what I mean. It's a very much a more American than you think. And he, here, if we think that my, I'm investing in you, because that's how the Jews think. It just so happened that their religion was also tied into the ethnicity, right? But not for us. We're thinking the, the kingdom of God, right? And if we're raising our kids for that, then we will produce, we will produce a generation and the next generation that will walk with God. Going back to what we just talked about, training up the, the, the child in the way he wants to go, which will, which will be dictated by the culture most of the time, the individualism that's in the culture, I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to be this, and I think you understand my heart. I'm not saying we can't have those things, but that's not the focus. If you think about it, schooling, going to school, okay, whether you're homeschooling or public school, college, it's all geared to us to be a, an American citizen, a productive American citizen. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm saying that for us Christian, our focus should be my training and my, my raising you up is focused on you staying in the kingdom of God and serving God. All the other stuff is secondary and tertiary. It's not even, it's not even registering on my radar. Because if not, we will raise kids in, in our churches who will leave the things of God or not be as fervent as we are. And we will look and say, I wonder what happened. And we may have done everything that we thought were right. Maybe not anything glaring wrong, but the point is we did not put emphasis on the cult Christian culture, by the way, not, not just our home culture or the American culture, Christian culture, the word culture, bringing them up to teaching them these things because that's how this is who we are. These are our people. Not just necessarily these people in this room, but, but the church of, of God globally. These are our people, and we belong in the kingdom of God. Is this making sense? I don't mean to, I don't mean to sound deep or, or, or however I'm sounding, but it's important that the church culture that we have, that we inherit, is 100% based on that passive discipleship on how we're doing at home. If we raise kids up, that don't know what it means to have a pastor or how to relate to the pastor, that's because we did not demonstrate that necessarily to them. You know? and, and if we don't demonstrate that to them, then they're going to go and just be individualistic. It'll be just be an individual in the America, caught up in the American dream, chasing the American you know, uh, way of life, and not really thinking kingdom-minded. Does that make sense? OK, all right. So let, uh, let's see. Drop down to verse, uh, let's see here. Mm. Look, verse 17. Let me just add this to it as well. Let the elders, the same chapter, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and in doctrine. That's talking about a pastor. That's talking about the person. On, and, it, and notice again, it just says it and just moves on. You know, and I, I think when the, the time I preached on this, I said, you and I, as kids, God gives us parents, and they're supposed to be over us. 
teaching us things, guiding us in the place, and we honor them, and it goes well with us. In our, in our culture, it's 18, but once we become adult, we, become, we should go under a spiritual leadership, whether that's a pastor, however that Christian culture is, you know, some people call it a bishop, whatever it is. And, and that now becomes a, our oversight, and it's saying that, hey, as a kid, you only know how to do this much, and you honor them. But now as an adult, I'm telling you, it's going to look differently, but I'm telling you that now they, that person is, has to have double the honor. Think about that. How would a kid do that if they don't, there's never been demonstrated to them? They don't know how to do that. Now, again, you can tell them all day, we honor, we honor, it means highly esteemed, but what does that mean? How does that flesh out? Have you ever had a teacher that doesn't ever do examples? And then have you had a teacher who t does examples on the board? The example is much better, isn't it? Because now you're like, oh, okay, this is what you've been saying the whole time. Okay, you carry the one. This is what you mean by carrying the one. If you think about it, that sounds weird. Yeah, when you're adding, when you do this, you carry the one. What does that mean? Carry the two. What does that mean? And then, let me show you. This, this, this. Carry one. Oh, okay, that's what you mean by carrying the one. Because you don't, it, it just sounds foreign. And a lot of times, the word of God, believe it or not, sounds very foreign. Now, you and I... Every culture does this. We read it through the lens of our American culture and get some parts right, but we get a lot of parts wrong because we don't really know the context by which it, it, it's said. But truly, if we read it and, and see it lived in front of us, then we understand what to do. There's many scriptures that says that, um, um, like, like for example, in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, Right? And it tells us, if you drop down to, I think, verse 17, it says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the only glory of the only begotten Son, right? And it's talking about Jesus Christ. But we understand he came to die for us, but what's the other reason he came? To demonstrate the word of God. You and I, whether we're discipling somebody, whether we're discipling our kids, this is what we're talking about, pastor discipleship, we have to be the manifestation of the word of God to that dis disciple as a discipler. We have, to, we have to demonstrate that to them. Because without that, it is, it's, it's just not going to stick as well. Amen? Um, Brother Chad, do you have anything to add? I knew you said you might say something. All right, let's just keep going. I've made God, I'll just go about a couple more scriptures, and then we'll, we'll finish. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5. I hope you understand. Like I said, this is a very simple concept, so it's not more, I'm not going to be building on doctrine. I'm just going to expound on it and give some examples. I'm not going to preach too long because we didn't have announcements, so I know that if I'm not careful, I'll preach longer than I'm supposed to. All right, first Peter chapter 5, let's look at verse 2. Talking to pastors. Uh, let's, let's start from verse 1. The elders who are among you I exhort, I who also am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, uh, serving as an overseer, not by compulsion, but willingly, not by dishonor, dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over them, um, but being example to the flock. Notice that. Again, it tells you not just teaching them, not just teaching them, but being an example of the believer to the flock. So living it out. Whether it's, uh, again, here it's, it's, written to the, it's written to the pastor. So Pastor Chris or whoever, Dr. Barclay, whoever, they're suppo we're supposed to look at them, and I say this all the time, whoever your disciple is, my son at some, at some point, and I, I pray and, and hope and, and everything within me that this is, becomes the truth for him. At some point, if he's on his own, I don't know what age that would be, 10, 11, or even you know, 12, maybe 15, older, he comes to a situation, he should be able to say, I wonder what dad would do in this situation. I wonder how dad will handle this. If he can say that, 
that's something wrong. Then I, didn't, then I only told him the word. I never lived it in front of him. Because he knows what to do. He, he can quote, just like most of us can quote many scriptures that we don't do. He'll probably quote, quote many scriptures. But the point is, I wonder what that looks like. I wonder what dad will do, do in this situation. I wonder how dad will handle it. That's what this is saying. At some point, we have to be able to, to do that. Or it, uh, us ourselves. We, we shouldn't only just think of what does the word say. We ought to think, how does it manifest? How does it become it flesh? How does it, how does it actually work out? Right? And it's not just this, who is so deep and it's so doctrine. No, it, it has to be practical. Look, everything we do, and I know sometimes, you know, other, some places get it wrong. Hear my heart in this, okay? We don't live to come to church, to pray, to do all those things. It's the opposite. We pray, we come to church, we read our Bible so we can live a godly life. It's not the other way around. I understand. We, we, I know we say that. I understand we say we serve the God. God, we put the kingdom of God first. Yes. But hear my heart in this. The point of all this is so that it would improve actual actions that we do in life to live and make godly decisions. So if it doesn't, then what's the point? Then it's just, we might, literally, it will be better to just stay home and watch, I, I think football is on now, whatever it's on. It might be better to just be home and sleep, do whatever it is. It's, the, it's, it's supposed to church, and again, I don't I hear my heart. Church is not, we, we don't live to just church. We don't live to just, I, I prayed 100 hours you know, this month or whatever. But yeah, what did that do? Is it serving a purpose, or are we just praying because, so we can tell somebody, I prayed 100 hours this month, right? Amen? Amen. Amen. Is it difficult to pray when you have nothing to pray about? I, I mean, I'm not, look, I know you're thinking, he's blaspheming a lot today. Look, let's be real about this, okay? Sometimes you go in prayer, and you're like, man, I just prayed 100 hours about, you know, just exaggerate. I just prayed... Ten hours about this issue and this issue and this issue, but I want to get my morning prayer in. And, and if you're a regiment on the time, like I got to pray 30 minutes, and you're there and you're like, I'm going to pray in tongues. But what are you doing? You're thinking about everything you need to do. Let's be honest. So my point is, we can't just be this legalistic. We have to pray this amount. The prayer is there to serve a purpose. Coming to church is supposed to in, inform us, put into us so we can live a godly life. Amen? I don't know why this is, is resist, getting some resistance here. I, I, I'm not saying that church is not important. I'm just saying that it's there for a purpose. I don't exist to come to church. I come to church so I can exist. It's not a, is, that, is that hard? Am I blaspheming here? Is, you know, someone texting pastor right now, get that guy, get that black guy off the stage right now. He's saying all kinds of heresy from Ghana. No. Hear my heart in this. Hear my heart in this. I'm just saying that we have to be real. Well, we can't be, we can't be fake and, and, and be, make, make Christian, Christianity or the word of God or church an unwarranted burden. It is a burden when it's warranted. But it's just unwarranted when it's like, uh, was, it, was it Brother um, Pastor Brent that was preaching this morning that gave the example of, of the girl that came to Pastor Brent and said, yeah, boy, I skipped, I skipped pastor, I skipped classes and prayed all day today. Yeah, you're supposed to go to class. You paid for class. You just became an unfaithful person by telling the professor you were going to be there at this time and not show up. And it's not because the Spirit of God arrested you to pray, or it's not because something happened and you're like, oh my goodness, we need to pray because so-and-so is in the hospital. You just decided, that's, the ex that's what I'm talking about. You just decided that I live to pray, so I'm going to stop everything and go pray. No, that's not life. That's not how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be all this is so we can be better Christians and be better people and serve God better. And if it's not, then something is wrong and you need to assess what you're doing, whether it's prayer, whether it's Bible reading, whether it's coming to church. Yeah, I'm not saying stop coming. I'm just saying that it's supposed to do something. Just like going to class and learning is supposed to be better. 
Right? You would never say, I exist to go to class. No, no one, no one just loves to go to class. You, that's a hundred things you could be doing. It's for a purpose. And all I'm saying is, if it's not serving its purpose, we need to evaluate it and, and, and check our heart. Amen? All right, I'm just going to quit and go home. No, no, you're receiving it. I know sometimes, sometimes you're thinking about what I'm saying. I'm just giving you a hard time. Uh, but I, I hope this, you know, there's more scriptures here we can go through, but I think you, you catch the heart of what I'm saying. Is when it, whether it's discipleship, parenting, and I don't mean if you're the disciple, right? even if you're at the end of it, the practice of it is, is key. The demonstration of it is key. That's, you know, that's the two things we talk about, passive parenting or passive discipleship versus active. The active is when we are actually instructing in something. We're saying, do this, do that. But do we demonstrate it? And in our own life, we have to find the opportunities to do it. Amen? All right, hopefully you receive it today. I, I mean, again, we can talk about some more things, but we'll just stop here and pray. We'll try to get out a little early since there was no announcements. And I think, I've, actually, I've preached over an hour, I think. So we can just, um, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for the word. Lord, you're so good to us. Father, I pray that nothing I said today uh, looks like or comes across like I'm undermining anything that pastor is teaching or our church believes. Father, let people hear the heart and understand the scriptures of what I'm teaching. Lord, if there's any questions, Lord, I pray that you help them. If they, if they need to come talk to somebody, Lord, I pray that they find their way to do it. Lord, we love you. We love you, Lord, that you've given us all these tools, a church, a Bible, the Holy Spirit, Lord, uh, curriculum, a lot of uh, Bibles to theologians, all these things to make us better Christians. These things are not just things we do in and of itself but they're supposed to bring us closer to you. They're supposed to strengthen our walk. And Father, I pray that every single one of us here heard not what I said, but what you said to them specifically. And I know there are some issues or things that people are going through that, that somehow the Spirit of God took what I said and, and fit it to that, issue, uh, to that situation. And Lord, I pray that we don't miss that. Whatever it is that however this ministers to us, Lord, May we not miss it. May we not miss what God is saying to us. May we receive it, receive it, receive it, and do it. I'm going to give you an opportunity to just pray. As we just talk about, praying is saying that it's the first rule. You don't have to say it so loud that everybody can hear you as long as you're saying something. I'm going to give you an opportunity to just act on the word of God. As we just said, just hearing it is not enough. You have to act on it. And even if that said, whatever you feel like you got from this, Pray and say, Lord, help me. Let's say you got that being a, a good disciple is to practice the word. Just pray and say, Lord, help me practice this word. Help me to do this word. Help me, whatever it is. I'm going to give you a few minutes. I'm going to pray that myself. I'll give you a few minutes and then I'll close this out in prayer. Father, I thank you for the word that I preach. I thank you that it convicted me. I thank you that you had something in it for me and my family and my wife. Lord, help me to be a better father. Help me to be a better husband, a better elder, a better employee. And Lord, help me to do the word. Help me to practice this. Help me to demonstrate the word of God to my family, to my wife, to my kids. Help me to demonstrate what a Christian looks like in every situation to my co-workers. May I look at it as an opportunity, Lord, to practice, to manifest the word. As you said, as you did, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the word that I had made become flesh in some way or somehow, in a, some, some opportunity that I have, Lord, to, to, to show to demonstrate to the spiritual world, the natural world, to my friends, to my, my family, Lord, what that particular word looks like. Lord, bless us all, Lord. Bless us all today. May we have a good week. May we have a, uh, a, a, a good day off if we're off tomorrow. I'm going to give us a chance. I see everybody. I think I've seen everyone before, but if there's anyone in here that needs prayer to rededicate their life, you feel like you've strayed from God, I'm not going to call you up. If you raise your hand, I'll pray with you and for you from where I stand. Is there anyone in the room? I think we're all Christians, but I'm looking around to see if there's anyone that needs prayer. All right. I don't see anybody, so I'll close us in prayer, and we'll get out a little early. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for church tonight. Father, may we be blessed. 
in our doing of the word. And Father, I, as I mentioned, it, it, it was impressed upon me to, to encourage everyone in the beginning of the service, Lord, to, um, to stick it out through the tough times, to speak the word. So if there are people here going through that, I pray that they feel the extra, extra touch of God, extra presence of God, and may they be comforted that this too shall pass. Whatever they've got themselves into or has happened to them, Lord, may they be strengthened by, by the word of God and may they be comforted by the comforter. Lord, for the rest of us, let us all have a good week and let us be back on Wednesday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I believe Pastor Caleb is preaching Wednesday, correct?